You know the Rosetta Stone, the ancient Egyptian stele that famously helped researchers crack the code of Egyptian hieroglyphs? With the same text written in both ancient Egyptian and in ancient Greek, it provided a direct comparison between a known language and a then mysterious language and alphabet. But this decipherment wasn't an overnight process, and there were many contributors whose insights helped bridge the gap between understanding the content of the Egyptian text and understanding the sounds represented by each and every mark on the stone. One of the most notable of these contributors was Jean-Francois Champollion, a French linguist who made the key supposition, what if the Egyptian language isn't entirely dead, what if it's just evolved? Champollion was able to tie the symbols on the stone not just to the concepts and words described in the Greek text, but to the sounds of a real live language, Coptic. Coptic represents the last form of the ancient Egyptian language, and while it's much changed from how it sounded in the days of Ptolemy, Ramses, and Khufu, the connection was still close enough that Champollion was able to identify several Coptic words and word ancestors on the Rosetta Stone, giving him an unparalleled advantage in its decipherment. Egyptian was not the only lost writing system to have been deciphered. The Mayan glyphs were steadily unveiled over several decades in the mid to late 20th century. In that case, understanding the modern Mayan language was again key to understanding how its ancestral languages were written. While languages like Sumerian have no modern descendants, the decipherment of its cuneiform writing system relied on other languages written in similar systems that we did understand, such as Old Persian. Just having a descendant language isn't everything. The Rongo Rongo script of Easter Island remains enigmatic even though the language it encodes still has living speakers, and it sure helps. What do we do if we don't have either a bilingual Rosetta Stone text or a descendant language to work from? Well, then you get the Minoan language in Linear A. The Minoans were a Bronze Age civilization based on the island of Crete in modern-day Greece. As one of the first civilizations in Greece, preceding even the Mycenaeans of Trojan War fame, makers of bright and elaborate art pieces and palaces and witnesses of one of the great volcanic eruptions of ancient times, who knows what stories they might have to tell us. Unfortunately, their script, Linear A, remains undeciphered and no descendant of Minoan remains living to this day. Now, a later form of their writing system, dubbed Linear B, was used to write Greek for a time, and researchers have attempted to use this knowledge to decipher the older script. The problem is that, without knowing anything about the Minoan language, it's impossible to know the difference between a successful decipherment and somewhat readable gibberish. But what if there was a way around this? We may not have any living descendants of Minoan, but what if there was a bilingual text that could teach us the sounds and vocabulary of an ancient dead descendant language and then work back from there just like Champollion? As it turns out, such a text may just exist. In 1936, archaeologists working at the Dreros site on Crete unearthed a series of stones with the text written in both Greek and a mysterious language known as Ediocretan. The Ediocretans, a group whose name literally means true Cretans, lived on Crete at the time ancient Greece was first on the rise. They even get a shout out in Homer's Odyssey. There is a fair and fruitful island in the mid-ocean called Crete. It is thickly peopled and there are nine cities in it. People speak many different languages which overlap one another, for there are Archaeans, brave Ediocretans, Dorians of threefold race, and noble Pelasgi. <coughs> With artifacts from the culture dating from the 7th century to the 3rd century BCE, it's commonly thought that the Ediocretans could well be the descendants of the Minoans, indigenous to Crete and thereby earning their nickname as true Cretans. And what's more, their language wasn't written in some unknown mysterious script, but in plain Greek, albeit in a very old form of Greek. We can read their words and see that they are not in Greek or in any other known language, something entirely unique. So, if we have bilingual inscriptions in Greek and Ediocretan, and if we can read their writing, do we know Ediocretan well enough to be able to work backwards and decipher Minoan in Linear A? Well, unfortunately not really, but this is where things get interesting. See, even though the Ediocretan part of the text was legible, the Greek portion of it is rough. Spending thousands of years underground made the text very difficult to read, and there are several different theories on how it should be read. Fortunately, in the nearly 90 years since the stones were first uncovered, technology has advanced substantially, and we may well be able to finally make sense of the Greek portion of the text. But there's a big problem. You might have noticed that I haven't shown any color photos of the stones, and there's a reason for that. You see, the inscriptions uncovered at Dreros in 1936 have been missing for almost 80 years. So, what happened to them? Well, in short, World War II happened, and there's no known record of the artifacts since at least 1941. 
But that's not a very satisfying answer, and I think we can do at least a little bit better. I obviously don't know where they might have gone, but I'm going to lay out some possibilities and give my thoughts on what might have happened. So, what evidence do we have? Well, as to where the stones were being stored at the start of the war, I was only able to find one reference that wasn't behind one of those academic journal paywalls, and it's a little ambiguous. Henri von Effenter, one of the discoverers of the Dreros inscriptions, wrote in a footnote in 1961, As for the inscriptions that we had transported to the temporary museum of Neapolis, most of them seem to have disappeared during the last war. Von Effenter doesn't make it explicitly clear he's talking about these particular inscriptions, but in context that does seem to be the case. And Neapolis, or Neapoli as it is known in English, is the closest town to the Drero site and would be a logical place to keep any finds from digs there. Let's presume then that prior to the war, the inscriptions were still somewhere in the vicinity of Dreros and Neapoli, and had not been relocated to a larger city like Heraklion or off Crete entirely. If this is the case, it's good news in terms of the potential for the inscriptions to have survived the war in some form, as the area around Neapoli was spared much of the fighting. The Axis takeover of the island in May 1941 was fought mostly on the western portion of the island, with Germany moving into Neapoli and Dreros only after a larger British, Greek, and allied withdrawal from the area. Side note, I'm going to be referring to them just as Germans in this video, rather than the term they're usually known by in that era, just to keep the YouTube algorithm happy. For the remainder of the war, Crete was occupied by a combination of German and Italian forces. If we take Henri von Effenter at his word that the Dreros inscriptions went missing during the war and not after, it can be assumed that by the time the Greek and British forces returned to the museum where the inscriptions had been stored in 1945, they were already gone, presumably having been taken during the occupation. Which leaves us with a couple of possibilities. 1. German forces removed the inscriptions from the museums at Neapoli, but never took them off Crete, leaving them somewhere else on the island. 2. German forces took the inscriptions off Crete. Or 3. Someone else, either a local or a soldier from another country, removed the inscriptions from the museum. This last option, while well within the realm of possibility for sure, seems like the least likely to me, simply because there doesn't seem to have been much of a phenomenon of looting on Crete during the Axis occupation, and given Germany's iron fist rule over the areas it occupied and their fascination with antiquities, I simply don't see them not keeping a watchful eye on any museums that might have housed them. Which brings us to the other possibilities, that the Axis forces on the islands were the ones who removed the inscriptions from the museum at Neapoli. This would be very much in character, and there's plenty of evidence that Germany was doing just that in Crete. Germans were eager to prove that the ruling classes of the later Greek and Roman civilizations were Germanic, and obscure any evidence to the contrary. Tech and travel journalist Phil Butler postulates that the Germans were likely skeptical that the Minoans were the true forebearers of European civilization, and they were well aware of the existence of the Ediocretan language and some of the then-recent scholarly work on the topic. In fact, the Germans were so interested in Crete that they sent Austrian archaeologist August Schergendorfer to conduct excavations on the island mid-war under the guidance of Austrian Major General Julius Ringel. In an incredible follow-up to Schergendorfer's time on Crete, Greek archaeologist Dr. Georgia Flauda was able to meet with his still-alive widow in Austria in 2010 to try to access any records that might give modern archaeologists some ideas of what he and his cohorts were up to on Crete during the war. While Flauda didn't get any comprehensive list of excavations, Schergendorfer was able to produce a photo album which located her late husband to multiple sites in Crete, including sites connected to the Minoans, and including locations in the prefecture where Neapoli and Dreros are located, although not those places specifically. In addition to his illegal excavations on the island, Schergendorfer was known to have taken loot from his time there, bringing back dozens of pieces to his native Austria where he worked at the University of Graz. In November 2017, the University of Graz returned 26 artifacts taken from Crete during World War II, which seems to be a great lead for where the Dreros inscriptions might have ended up. Personally, I think if the University of Graz had them, however, they would have found out about it by now, and I don't know why they would have kept these artifacts in particular hidden when they were willing to give back others. That being said, I do think that the inscriptions ending up somewhere in mainland Europe, and quite possibly Austria specifically, seems the most likely. Given the lack of major battles on the island after the initial Axis takeover, it's unclear when the occupiers might have decided they needed to remove the inscriptions, but Austria would have remained a place that, even if a last-minute decision were made, would have been available to receive looted goods. Combined with one of the key archaeologists and the Major General overseeing his work both being from Austria, that's where I'd put my money, at least in the years immediately following the war. 
But as we know from cases like one of the long lost imperial Fabergé eggs showing up at a flea market in the American Midwest, once something enters the informal arts market, it's almost impossible to know where it might eventually end up. So if you're ever at your local flea market and just happen to see this random chunk of stone, maybe take a note of it because I think this disc seems like a real page turner or page roller or whatever you'd call it.